Greetings and welcome all to what promises to be a rich and interesting conversation with Jack Z. Bradich and Leopoldina Fortunati. I am Malav Kanuga, publisher of Common Notions Press. We are particularly thrilled to host this conversation about patriarchy, war, and microfascism, which takes up themes from Jack Bradich's recent book on microfascism, gender, war, and death. The conversation following the book will examine the cultural dimensions of patriarchy, white supremacy, and nationalism, and make the compelling case for why feminist anti-fascist political thinking and action is a necessary part of every fight we have to confront in order to live. I am delighted to briefly introduce our speakers today. Jack Z. Bradich is professor in the Journalism and Media Studies Department at Rutgers University. In addition to On Microfascism, he is also author of Conspiracy Panics, Political Rationality and Popular Culture, and co-editor of Foucault, Cultural Studies and Governmentality. Leopoldina Fortunati is Professor of Sociology of Communication and Culture in the Department of Mathematics, Computer Science and Physics at the University of Udine. She is the founder of NUME, a laboratory of research on new media. Her research in the field of gender studies, cultural processes, communication and information technologies is extensive and informed by autonomous feminist and Marxist insights developed in the feminist and workerist struggles in Italy since the 70s. Leopoldina Fortunati is the author of many publications and books, including The Arcane of Reproduction, Housework, Prostitution, Labor, and Capital. Jack and Leopoldina, it is an honor to host you both. Finally, I want to once again welcome all of you who've joined our live stream and encourage you to subscribe to the Common Notions YouTube channel and Facebook and place your questions and comments in the chat so you can join the conversation today. Jack, over to you. Oh, thanks, Malav. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, I want to just extend my uh, gratitude to Common Notions for working uh, so closely and thoroughly and helpfully on this book um, uh, and for hosting this along with um, a co-sponsorship with Red May Seattle. Um, and, and I'm thrilled to be in conversation uh, with Leopoldina Fortunati, whose work I've admired for some time, for a long time, and was uh, a, a crucial component to the, to the elements of this book, especially in the final chapter. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so I'll, I'll just start. I think the format is I will talk about some themes that are in the title from uh, the book on microfascism for about 25 minutes. And then uh, uh, Leopoldina and I will have a conversation. She will have some remarks. Uh, we'll have a conversation and then we'll open it up um, to you all. So I'm eager to hear uh, your thoughts. Okay, so, you know, the, the recent uh, uh, leak, the Supreme Court memo leak um, about Roe v. Wade in the U.S., uh, along with, well, you know, the last couple of months, the uh, last few months of the, of the, uh, institutionalization of anti-trans and anti-LGBTQ um, into policies, bills, and laws um, mean that the U.S. in some ways has caught up, oddly, with the rest of the world um, and other parts of the world. Um, uh, insofar as for years now, gender has been at the core of understanding the transnational right wing when it comes to Latin America, when it comes to various places in Europe um, where feminicide has been on the agenda, where uh, the sort of European transnational right wing far right has placed anti-gender ideology or gender ideology at its core, as, it, as its core kind of enemy, that the glue that holds together so much of the transnational far right. So the U.S. Um, is coming to learn this now. Uh, it's not that it hadn't known it before in some ways, in some pockets, but now it's become central. Um, I would say part of that is because the understandings of the far right in the U.S. over, I'd say, the last you know, 10 to 12 years has focused on, importantly, things like um, you know, U.S. based notion, U.S. based notions of race, um, of settler colonialism, of white supremacism, um, and in that understanding, misogyny and uh, and other kinds of gender uh, violence were seen as stepping stones or gateways to um, those, you know, uh, uh, those kinds of right wing formations around uh, white supremacy. Um, so I think now what we're starting to see is that. Uh, that gender has been so crucial, misogyny has been so crucial to the rise of 
the the right in the U.S. Um, and, and there have been people who have talked about it. So I want to you know I want to say that you know folks like Matthew Lyons have, have made it central. Um, uh, Spencer Sunshine in their in their understanding of the far right, they place misogyny importantly. But then the book comes out right now with others who are connecting feminism and fascism, feminism, and anti-fascism. Uh, Lori Penny's new book on the sexual revolution, for instance, um, uh, Eva Majewska uh, has a book called Feminist Anti-Fascism. Um, Petronella Lee in 2019 had this really excellent um, uh, sort of, you know, uh, uh, zine slash um, short monograph that collected the, the kind of crucial uh, uh, elements, and it's called Anti-Fascism Against Machismo, Gender Politics and the Struggle Against Fascism. So people are writing about it. But I, this book enters into that uh, into that world and begins to understand um, uh, ways that gender is, 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 is crucial. So I also want to shout out um, uh, to the Institute for Research on Male Supremacism, who also just came out with a book called Male Supremacism in the U.S., also making a similar argument about um, the centrality of gender. OK, so that's setting up where we are and why um, why I think the U.S. is sort of making, you know, its initial attempts as a, as a, as a culture to figure this out. OK. Um, so the question posed here is what does a feminist anti-fascism look like? And part of the reason that I think that's an important question um, is that anti-fascism, uh, as we know it, it, should not be a matter for the state or carceral logics to, um, to monopolize. Um, and I think what's happening lately is that, is that uh, anti-fascism itself is being sort of taken up by the U.S. state as a kind of uh, criminal um, uh, endeavor, a carceral endeavor, to find the right wing and to jail them in the, in the sense of January 6th, the way the FBI profiles um, uh, the, the far right, right? Um, uh, so uh, Guattari had, a, had an essay once, Philip Guattari had an essay called um, Everybody Wants to Be a Fascist. And of course, that's too universalizing. But I think what, um, what I'd like to turn that into right now is, is that Everybody wants to be anti-fascist, even the fascists. Um, and what do I mean by that? Let's take the, a, a, a pretty obvious example right now on the global stage of uh, Russia and Ukraine. Um, on Victory Day, um, you know, both sides claim not only uh, both sides claim to be um, fighting some version of Nazism or fascism. Um, right. Obviously, denazification has been Putin's, uh, uh, you know, justification, alleged justification for this, even while his ethno-nationalist um, uh, imperialist project goes on, um, which, of course, involves, you know, um, uh, a, quite a traditional patriarchal reduction of uh, social relations and gender relations, among other things. Meanwhile, Zelensky, um, you know, uh, compares Putin to Hitler on those days and to Nazis. Meanwhile, tweets a picture of a Ukrainian soldier wearing the Totenkopf, a death's head symbol that was associated with the uh, Nazi SS, right? So um, so in that moment, not to flatten these things out, but it, it's it's almost like everyone wants to grab this notion um, uh, and to fight fascism. I've been tracking the, the U.S. sort of QAnon far right, and they too seem to be claiming that they are fighting fascism. So, OK, well, in that case, you know, if uh, we have to sort of stake out a claim for what the kind of anti-fascism is that we need. And so I think an idea of feminist anti-fascism becomes uh, quite crucial to that. But that means including starting with a feminist understanding of fascism itself. Now, I will say and I, uh, uh, that even in the sort of classic versions of fascism, the interwar 20th century European version, um, that there were folks who were doing feminist anti-fascism thinking, including Virginia Woolf, who has, a, who has an essay on this. Um, uh, but I will just, I'll just quote uh, 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 Petronella Lee, who I mentioned earlier. Um, and she says that fascism, quote, is an exacerbation, a more militant extension of the patriarchal relationships between men and women that have persisted for centuries, end quote. This is not that far from the... Um, uh, the, the writer Klaus Thewlett, who also understood the power of the gender as a mode of production that was crucial to the understanding of the Fry Corps. This, these were the kind of wandering um, veterans post-World uh, War I who became the kind of violent uh, underpinning 
um, for the rise of, of Nazi Germany. Um, but he, in his, in his two volumes set in male fantasies, um, he, he spends a lot of time understanding the kind of construction of masculinity um, uh, and violence uh, that was part of that, the series of war bands. Okay, um, so I guess what I would say then is that um, I'm trying to think what, what elements of the, the book I want to also bring up. So, so what we're seeing partially in the U.S. is the most visible version, uh, which is the kind of uh, even self-identified Christian fascism, um, right? The, these are the ones that want to actually take over the state um, and its institutions and restore a very traditional uh, patriarchal in the sense of heteronormative family um, and a, and a, uh, a father-led and masculine-led household. Um, and that's at a macro level, um, a kind of theocracy project, right? Um, but there's something also more amorphous happening in the U.S., and maybe that actually uh, explains why the U.S. took a while um, to get to this point. And that's the kind of more amorphous uh, cultural dimension um, that is partially monotheistic in the sense of Christianity, but also has another dimension to it, which is something um, more underground, uh, more even countercultural at times that's embedded in the media sphere. Now, the alt-right was a way to name that, um, I'd say five, six years ago. Um, but, you know, I think that kind of phase is, is, is over. And there are other ways to think about the right and uh, underground culture. We can talk about that if you want. But I will just mention to talk about how I'm thinking about um, culture insofar as it's connected to kind of patriarchal violence. I'll name sort of three examples. And these are uh, uh, examples of violence. So I, I should say um, that if, you know, if uh, there will be some uh, stories, news stories that are, are quite uh, violent that I won't get into the graphics, uh, graphically into, but, but I should mention that, that, you know, some of this obviously involves things like um, uh, mass murders. Um, so um, for last year, three, it was like a quarterly uh, event. So um, in early 2021, the most famous of them is the Atlanta uh, spa killer, um, uh, right, who killed uh, Asian American women primarily um, in these spas. And, the, and his reason given was that they were temptresses, right, that he couldn't he couldn't stop himself because of um, uh, because they were so tempting and uh, uh, around his his desire for them. So they had to be eliminated. Right. Um, so and he had to eliminate his desire through the elimination of women. Uh, so that's a fairly classic um, uh, idea in, in, you know, in, in certain elements of Christianity about what a woman is. Uh, and so and the, 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 the need to eliminate. OK, the second one, less well known, but uh, I'd say still prominent um, and more about our times. So Robert Coleman in the in the summer of 2021 um, uh, took two his two kids uh, to Mexico from California um, and uh, and murdered them. Um, and the reason he gave was that uh, he had visions that his wife had a serpent DNA in her. Um, so the the mass media, the, the mainstream media focused on his sort of affiliations, quasi affiliations with QAnon around this. But what I think they missed is that uh, most of these accounts is that he was also a, um, a surf instructor for Christian youth groups. And that this is this idea of a woman being possessed by a serpent um, is fairly embedded in, uh, in Christian mythology. So so the, to not recognize that and to just focus on something as, uh, uh, you know, as sort of uh, extreme or just sort of like spectacular as QAnon misses the deep seated dimensions of this kind of patriarchal violence. And the third one probably even less well-known, the, la- the very last week of December of 2021 in Denver, there, were, there was a mass shooting um, uh, around uh, tattoo parlors uh, by, uh, by a, a guy named uh, Lyndon McLeod. Now, the thing about McLeod is he was not um, a Christian. Um, he, if anything, identified as an atheist, and I think maybe it's some kind of uh, uh, pagan or occult uh, uh, settings. Um, but he... he glorified, um, you know, what he thought were warrior societies. Um, and he, you know, the, the, the religious dimension to it is that he admired um, honor killings, right? And he thought that the West didn't have enough honor killings, unlike, um, uh, in, in his mind, Islam is what he would identify. So um, that element did not come out so much, right? People try to figure out how much of a white supremacist he was, but misogyny was at the core of what he did. Okay. Um, so all this to me, you know, leads me to this concept that we need to look and connect things at the level before they become 
state policies or even social movements or organized efforts to look at the kind of more informal but coordinated uh, campaigns and operations that together form, uh, you know, this, this kind of um, uh, 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 sort of insur in in insurgency around um, patriarchal uh, fascism. But it's in the sphere that, that I call, borrowing a term, um, I call microfascism, and that's the name of the book. So I'll just say briefly something about microfascism. Um, it's a concept that's found in scattered form in a lot of Felix Watery's writings, sometimes with, with Deleuze, sometimes not. Um, so I try to flesh it out a little bit to trace its long history in addition to its contemporary forms. Now, the micro here, just to be, be clear, is, is not just small, right? Um, uh, it might be a little less perceptible, but it's also pervasive. So if you think about uh, microaggressions, for instance, um, it's not the, the fact that there are these little things that, um, uh, that matter. It's that there's a, a pervasive environment um, of those, right, that, that, that's created through the, uh, the accumulation of these. So, so we can think about it if, if you want to from uh, to not think about something like microbes, but the microbiome, right? It's a kind of system. It's an ecology, um, a sphere of that sort. And I find it to be um, ordinary and everyday. That's why I focus on this idea of microfascism. So I'll just say very quickly the three dimensions of microfascism that I find important. This is what helps me think through what's uh, what the present is. Um, uh, one is that it does address in a, in a significant way culture. Um, so that is before there's a state, before there's a fascist sort of uh, takeover or a party or a, uh, even a social movement identifiable in terms of groups and organizations, there might, there's a space and a series of techniques that form a, a, and compose a social body, a kind of collective subject that underpins, supports, and mobilizes the, these more formal powers that come afterwards. Right. Um, uh, back in the in the mid 80s, uh, Umberto Eco um, said something similar when he talked about Ur fascism, you are fasc fascism, Ur fascism. Right. That behind uh, uh, any regime or ideology is a whole way of life, a series of habits, ways of thinking, ways of being and feeling um, that uh, uh, and instincts and drives. And it's that drives that also uh, lead to the second one, that that this is about a, a social production of desire and subjectivity. This is. Uh, this is how Guattari also uh, lays it out. What we're talking about is a social investment of energies um, to create reality. Um, that, that creation of reality is um, embedded and in, in anchored in a self. Specifically, a self, um, how am I get, getting to, um, uh, maybe, maybe a little too uh, tangential here, but I would say it's a self that only can be itself by subordinating others. OK, so one of the ways that I uh, define fascism, drawing from fascism, fascism, fascism studies, sorry, is the idea of palingenetic eliminationism. It's a mouthful. I get it. Um, but I want to say that it, as a concept, it, it, it brings together a dynamic in which for something or someone to renew itself, it can only do so at the exclusion, reduction uh, and elimination of others, right? So it's a dynamic um, of palingenetic, right? It, it continues to renew uh, itself and only then the eliminationism part, um, but it can only do so at the expense of others. So it or orders the world um, through giving itself a kind of power uh, to, um, to be a sovereign, which then that sovereignty repeats itself, renews itself only by subordinating others um, uh, in that way. So this is where I trace that dynamic through masculinity and through patriarchy. Um, and okay, so maybe I'll just jump over the, the third one is just about forms of collective bodies um, and networks and distributed decentralized formations. That's what microfascism uh, allows us to see. So culture, um, uh, desire and subjectivity, and then a, a networked form or distributed form uh, of, of these collective bodies. Okay, so let me just say some things about patriarchy uh, as I as I keep track of time here. Um, so why patriarchy? Um, why not misogyny, sexism, hegemonic masculinity, male supremacy, masculine supremacism? Key words, very important words, um, uh, and ways of getting to a lot of these same things. I'd say what I what I still like about the term is that a it talks about a form or an order of rule. Um, it is more systemic as a kind of dimension, is a systemic dimension of how uh, order operates, right? So um, 
even though it's technically sort of, um, right? One would say, well, it's only one position. It's it's the the the, the pater, right? It's the father. Um, it's the rule of the father, right? Um, I think that's also quite limiting um, because that rule of the father was also a series of rules by and hierarchies organized by leader figures, whether it's the father, whether it's a, it's a king or a leader, um, a political leader, and ultimately a divine figure, uh, God, right? Um, uh, so, so to me, patriarchy gets at that idea that it, while it's technically one position in that chain, um, but it's not just the household uh, that matters. It gets at all these heads, um, the, the heads of state, the heads of household, um, and the sort of uh, the, the, the spiritual head, the divine uh, figurehead. Um, and so, which also gets at this issue of, of sovereignty. Okay. Also, the reason I want to talk about patriarchy, and I'll, and I'll mix it up a little bit in, in here in a second, is that um, I think that we uh, limit ourselves by focusing on modern uh, forms of order when it comes to gender. That is, um, that there are still kinds of... Uh, either residual elements or certainly elements that are attempting to be restored by uh, the, the, the fascists um, around pre-modern orders. So um, patriarchy, if we think about it as a concept, it allows us to get to this idea of it being primordial. And what I mean by that is certainly not natural, certainly not eternal or universal, but prime order, right? The first order, the way that ordering itself as a political project, as a social project, has uh, roots in a gender binary, a gender difference, and a, um, uh, uh, and a hierarchy of gender. Um, and so um, I, I'll say more about that, about the ways that basically you know the multiplicity and the and the and the mutability of uh, of things we call gender um, uh, were historically um, you know kind of a, a limited, controlled, um, organized around a binary and then hierarchized around that. So patriarchy gets at this idea of the an order that that does this. So it's pre-state, um, it's pre-nation, and it's certainly pre-capitalist, um, which which. We also need to know how capitalism and settler colonialism and white supremacy obviously have incorporated and organized that. But we also need to know how um, patriarchy itself um, has different forms. P capitalist patriarchy is one form of it, um, and not just patriarchal capitalism, but capitalist patriarchy. Okay, um, so, but the the thing I want to highlight here about um, um, about patriarchy as as an order is the way that Celia Amoros, um, a um, Latin American feminist philosopher talks about uh, patriarchy as a series of pacts, P-A-C-T-S, right? Pacts that um, in the ways that the, the ways that patriarchy at least operates um, is a series of um, sort of not just compacts, but a series of brotherhoods, um, fraternities that are basically built on um uh, forms of warfare that eventually become other institutionalized forms. These are pre-modern forms that also find their way into modern institutions. Um, it's a variation of what Carolyn Pateman said long some time ago also about the um, that brotherhoods replace patriarchy as a kind of a form of gender uh, uh, hierarchies and um, uh, that the patriarchy is pre-modern where the brotherhoods are, are important. And I will mention once again, Zelensky and Putin in a second about brotherhoods. Um, brotherhood wars. But I, I think what I'll just kind of highlight here as a kind of conceptual point is that Amoros's idea of pacts is related to, um, to as I said, masculine war bands, which themselves were, were crucial to, to the ways that, that uh, fascists in the interwar period and today think of their organizing forms. And that is, there's a German word, Mannerbund, um, uh, that is about these kind of men's societies uh, that, uh, that form um, and, and specifically around war, but not always about war, um, but the kind of fraternity that happens and brotherhood around that. Now, um, I can say more about that later, about how I think in the U.S. those modern buns are happening, which are not the kind of classic uh, versions, but these more decentralized and, uh, and often uh, uh, forming in digital culture um, forms of these uh, modern bund, contemporary modern bund through gamer squads and other kinds of um, uh, formations. Okay, but but ideally, not ideally, but but sort of to go back to the, this point is that um, war becomes the origin of patriarchy in this in this sense, right? The patriarchy is a kind of settled 
form, the settled order after the war that is waged um, on women. And um, I, I can I'll say more about that later, but I'll just I'll just you know point you to Maria Mieza's work on on patriarchy and accumulation on this around acquisition, appropriation, early forms of property, the hunt, the raid, the um, the captivity. Uh, so. But just take a step back, do some something concrete again, an analysis of brother wars. So let's go back to Ukraine and Russia. Um, uh, while they are obviously uh, hostilely opposed to each other um, in, in kind of fundamental ways, there's an interesting way if, if we place gender um, into the mix, uh, what we see are two uh, variations of this kind of uh, the world of uh, patriarchal instrumentalization of women. Now, what we know about Putin is that, uh, uh, and Putinism, um, and uh, that kind of the ethno-nationalist, um, uh, patriarchal restorationist uh, component of, of Putinism, is that it's a fairly traditionalist, as I said, patriarchy. It's household-based, political control, tied to Orthodox Church, um, uh, and uh, that kind of restoration. Now, um, Zelensky, you know, even though he has been uh, hailed uh, as a warrior hero, um, even, a, a, you know, a, a kind of mediated uh, intense object of uh, lust in the pages in the op-ed of uh, Washington Post about a month ago, a um, month or so ago about, you know, this, this sort of um, what a great warrior artist and, uh, and, and the sexy warrior artist he is. Um, you know, he tends to traffic more in terms of the traffic in women around an economy, uh, a liberal and neoliberal economy of the marketplace, where um, he has talked about Ukrainian women as you know, like the, their, their beauty is the brand uh, of, of Ukraine. Right. So so that kind of like more <laughs> kind of post uh, Soviet Union moment where um, uh, where the uh, so many in Eastern Europe. Um, and in the former satellites were clamoring uh, to get into uh, the, the you know, neoliberal game um, and partially through nation branding. And for him, women are uh, beautiful women, that is. Uh, so women become objectified as part of the national brand to circulate on their own. So you can, the freedom of women are free to be valuable commodities um, and, um, uh, and such. So both are economies um, of, of trafficking in women um, that usually doesn't get talked about in this. So it's important, I think, just to bring it up. So now I think we do have this kind of mix of the brotherhood of fathers, right? A kind of pact among fathers. Okay, I'm checking the time here. Um, so, um, so what I would say, uh, I have a, um, a section called, uh, the, it's, uh, it's no longer leaders of the pack, but a pack of leaders. So everyone becomes this kind of self-made um, aristocrat uh, that gets uh, brought together in these war bands um, to form a kind of uh, uh, patriarchal uh, insurgent populism. Um, but OK, so let me um, let me just check and see what I want to say here about about patriarchy before we move on, because um, I think I'm going to leave the kind of question. Um, uh, I'm not going to have much time to talk about the different ways I think about um, uh, feminist anti-fascism. Hopefully that will come out later. But but I'll just say something at the quite at the, at the very end. But I just want to say something about palingenetic eliminationism, again, is that what it brings together is not just, uh, I want to just ward off ideas that, you know, that that this is about um, classic definitions where women's bioreproductive capacities um, are central to their uh, self-identity, or, or that's the sort of place to, um, uh, to, um, to anchor all of politics. In fact, it is about a series of reductions, right, and eliminations, which includes, um, reducing women to that kind of bioreproductive part. Um, however, it's also a reduction of the multiplicity of metamorphoses and metamorphosis machines that, um, that could produce all kinds of, uh, of, of what uh, Marquise Bay talks about as gender radicality, um, in which case, you know, what happens is a kind of a deep reduction of that transformation, of that transformational power of, the, of that uh, mutation. And what I talk about in the book is mimesis. Um, uh, as a kind of life to the hierarchical binary gender code and then the reduction of that one term. So to just be clear also, um, what we have seen also recently is that there are uh, uh, people who identify as women in such a way within that reduction, reductivist uh, concept of bioreproduction to the exclusion of that first uh, grouping of the of the kind of gender radicality that often gets uh, associated with trans and trans feminists. So, so I just want to say that there's a that that turf the turfing is a kind of self reduction 
in addition to a reduction of others that repeats the kind of patriarchal um, uh, eliminationism. Okay. Um, well, I think what I'll sort of end with then is to just say that um, the kind of sovereignty that we're starting to see on the rise again, what I call an autogenetic sovereignty, a sovereignty, a kind of capacity to act that's self-created, right? The self-created power of the self to, to enact order in the world is in crisis, right? And this is what's happening. Patriarchy is, is precisely in crisis um, uh, in that sense. So what's happening is a kind of reversion, um, the settled version of patriarchy, right? The householdization and housewifeization. But what we, because of that crisis, there's a return to the origins of that settlement, which means a kind of increase in the more acute forms of violence that come along with uh, the, the what Sylvia Federici and others have called the war on women, um, or as part of what uh, Eric Aliez and uh, Maurizio Lazzarato call wars of subjectivity, right? So that that crisis is happening now, and and so. Uh, what we can think of in terms of anti-fascism has to think about what other forms um, of life can we develop as anti-fascist ones in this moment of crisis. And I'll, I'll just end with by saying, we can follow this up, I think something like the um, uh, a variety of ways of thinking about uh, uh, abolition um, uh, that involves uh, uh, feminist versions of abolition and anti-fascism uh, anti um, are key. And that, that includes um, gender binaries, which also means creating and proliferating um, gender radicality and mutations, not just erasing things, but actually cultivating um, experiments in metamorphosis. Um, and but but certainly finding ways that to find the constricting and uh, oppressive categories that 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 are about captivity. Um, and so to abolish those forms of captivity, um, obviously, uh, it started with and starting with um, the carceral logics that find themselves in, in, in prisons, but the ways to think about uh, carceral logics and captivity logics more broadly. So, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. And I'm excited to hear um, uh, from you, Leopoldina, and everyone else. Thank you very much, uh, Jack. Um... Uh, for this uh, for the presentation of your book, uh, your book is a very uh, a book that I like a lot because it is original, innovative, and also predictive. Uh, because uh, uh, it gives a lot of instruments to understand um, also the logic that. Uh, informs the, 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 the war um, now uh, taking place between uh, Russia and against uh, Ukraine. Um, so it is a, mine is an invitation to everyone to uh, read this book. I learn a lot uh, reading this book um, and I found that, that from a, a feminist point of view, it is a, a, a book that has learned a lot from women because it uh, follows uh, the idea that the personal is political. And in fact, uh, uh, it analyze, uh, analyzes how uh, microfascism develops day by day in everyday life. Rightly, uh, Jack has... Uh, um, contextualized historically um, micro-fascism. Uh, 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 and uh, this is the only way to understand why today there is uh, this uh, great political and uh, cultural clash between two world views. Uh, no? uh, a view that uh, uh, a left uh, gen general left view that uh, um, pursues uh, the diversity and the equality of the value of the different uh, solidarity care and another view that uh, see the, sees the dominance of the masculine, the order, the subordination of women. And um, this clash, uh, it is a, 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 a true clash. This clash is an answer 
uh, we must understand why it is happening. And it is an answer to the fact that today um, uh, we face uh, with the huge and the fast social changes. And uh, a part uh, of uh, humankind uh, uh, is not available to accept them. Uh, uh, why? Because um, feminism has uh, uh, changed the, the structure, the dimension, the very existence of the family and the condition of women as well of, of childhood and the third age. Furthermore, feminism has also taken on the task of fighting over social identity and relative rights, as well as the economic recognition of domestic work. But uh, changing the family, which is the basis, uh, the basic cell, cell of society, means uh, changing uh, all the social and political structures rhetorical and metaphorical, which are based on it. Mm. For example, the uh, head of state is presented as the good father, the country as the big family to which uh, all citizens belong. In this uh, transformation that not only feminism, uh, a lot also of other movements, uh, mm, social move and political movements uh, uh, have contributed, uh, to this big change, in this uh, big change, men have lost power, while women empowered uh, gain a new power. And uh, this is uh, the question. Uh, the fact that uh, a lot of people do not accept this. Uh, a part of the humankind uh, um, uh, uh, is not able to metabolize this. Uh, um, why? But, but uh, we know why, because uh, uh, Sandra Harding, for example, was uh, um, an, uh, a student of uh, uh, Jung, um, proposed a very, uh, a very astute uh, vision of social change. She said that we should uh, look at uh, social changes as a, a spiral, no? and uh, there are changes uh, 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 in the top that are uh, very quick, but there are changing changes that uh, uh, concerns uh, the um, profound structures of humankind that are very difficult and very slow to be accepted. No? And we are in this uh, uh, situation now. Uh, uh, Jack, uh, Jack in, in his book also uh, underlined the, uh, the, 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 the combination of this difficulty, this uh, hostility, this uh, resistance against uh, the acceptation of these changes with the, the um, Manu manipulative ability of uh, social media and uh, media forms in controlling also the uh, information and uh, mm, and uh, uh, the elaboration of uh, uh, values and uh, uh, cultural forms. Uh, I have, but uh, I have. A series of questions. I, I, I limit it to three questions. Um, there is a, a, a Jack uh, um, underlined uh, in his book uh, this and uh, depicted this uh, a fresco, a, a wonderful fresco of uh, this phenomenon of micro uh, fascism. But uh, I would like uh, he talk a little bit about the gray zone into the right, uh, in which uh, um, uh, uh, there is all these uh, all these fascist value, but uh, uh, less uh, radical. Uh, so um, 
there is a, li a little bit of um, uh, idea that uh, women uh, exaggerate in their uh, pretense to have power like men, but they don't arrive uh, to a certain um, position like uh, uh, fascists uh, arrive. So there is this uh, gray zone uh, in the right uh, that uh, is very powerful and uh, stable and uh, is uh, growing a lot with microfascism. This is my first question. If, if uh, he can uh, mm, uh, build a little bit uh, on that. The second question I have is uh, on education. Uh, the education of young, young generations, because from his book, this uh, become a really uh, urgent uh, um, field of reflection for all of us. Um, we should, we all should be able to uh, to, to share with the new generation, with our um, children, uh, um, the, the development, the elaboration of a non-fascist fascist model of men and women. So on alternative model. So what is the model of uh, the right man and women, a woman that we propose to the new generation. Uh, uh, the, this is a, a very big question. The, the second issue that I have for Jack in his book is, uh, for example, no, um, the, uh, the need, if he thinks that we need to uh, analyze very uh, deeply uh, the ideology of this masculinity, fascist masculinity, that is conceived in terms of sovereignty and autonomy, for example, showing that this autonomy, male autonomy uh, from uh, femi the feminine is, uh, is uh, a myth, is not, uh, does not correspond to reality. Because we know that, for example, <clears throat> men who remain widows uh, uh, have a lot more difficulties than women uh, when they remain alone because uh, they don't know a lot of, uh, a lot of things. They, they are very much less autonomous. So there is a reality that... Uh, uh, doesn't, uh, of course, uh, correspond to the ideology. So we, we should uh, be able to deconstruct uh, all, all these. Um, and, uh, and the last question I have is uh, on um, patriarchy, because uh, um, it is uh, an notion that uh, I always... Uh, uh, found difficult to understand in the sense that uh, I think that there is uh, still a big space, a big room to reflect on this in, uh, in the sense that uh, we should be able to combine these uh, with the notion of class, uh, with the notion of microphysics of power uh, by Foucault, etc. Because otherwise uh, um, uh, uh, we uh, had difficulty again in uh, understanding uh, the, 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 uh, the, the real functioning of these, you know, they, um, in the sense that, for example, uh, he rightly, Jack rightly talked about the uh, rule of father, of the leader, but what about all the uh, uh, the men who are not leader, who are under the leader, and uh, um, the male children under the father. So there are a, um, uh, a hierarchy in all uh, these that we should 
um, pick up in uh, uh, and uh, analyze uh, with the, uh, more in detail, I think, to understand uh, really how this works. Thank you, Jack, if you uh, can build a little bit upon these uh, three points. Wow, yes, thank you so much, Leopoldina. These are, these are really uh, generative and expansive uh, questions and really get to the, get to the core of some of these, uh, some of these um, dimensions. So I'm gonna answer, I will answer all three. I also wanna say something about uh, something you said before the questions, which I really you know, caught my ear too, which is that the current situation um, or the recent situation about men losing power Mm -hmm. um, and then women being empowered, and that sort of set up the kind of response, right? The backlash is 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 is, is typically called against um, against women. Um, uh, uh, I I'm not sure. Okay, I, I, I'm trying to think about this idea of losing power, and I think you know uh, Sarah Benet Weiser in her book um, Empowered it talks about why it's always considered a zero sum game, as if it's like a quantity. Um, uh, so I, I would highlight that, and I would think about that it's 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 a loss of a particular kind of power, and this is where I get into the sovereignty, the autogenetic sovereignty. It's the it's it's a lost entitlement to think that one can separate oneself from the world and then come back and order that world. Like that that capacity, that power is actually what's being challenged. Um, not just sort of like agency in the world, right? But a very specific kind of, of the ability to determine and overcode other beings in the world. So I think that that to me is like, it's the power. So I, I'm thinking about the example I thought about as you were saying that is, and this will give us something at least <laughs> concrete or at least something about the cultural sphere. I, I am in media and cultural studies. So I do have a lot of examples about about uh, these things in the book. But one is the manosphere, right? Which is called the manosphere, this component um, of the internet um, that where some of that early men's rights activists were, were being developed, pickup artists, even some incels eventually. But when I think about that manosphere, the, I think about it as the effort, not just to have this kind of space for men and that's being sort of like taken away from them, but it's the, it's the attempt to become the entirety of the internet. The Manosphere was always a colonizing project. It was always an expansionist project to ensure that women do not appear um, in these newly public or newly social uh, digitized spaces, right? So, so, so I think that, so to me, that's an example of how that power is the, the power to determine who can show up and who needs to be in the household? Who needs to be in the private room? Right. So, so if that power is being lost, yes, um, I think that's part of the condition. However, it's not just any power, right? It's a very special um, patriarchal power. So, but that's I just thought of that. Okay. But the three questions, I love them all. Okay. I, I thank you so much for the fresco. I love the, the fresco of the phenomenon. That was wonderful. I appreciate that. Um, but yeah, the gray zone. Um, this is. This is the most kind of, um, uh, I mean, uh, the, the part of this that requires endless research because that gray zone continuously changes, right? That is exactly that milieu of the microfascism because it's not easily identifiable, right? It's, it's the emergent, right? It's, it's the qualities are, have not yet necessarily crystallized. They are in formation. Um, so it's harder to say like, oh, that's exactly the problem. It's more like this, even more than a spectrum, right? It's like a, it's a kind of, I mean, I don't have the good metaphors, right? But kind of an environment in which something catches or crystallizes or condenses. Um, but before it condenses, you can see the elements that are about to condense. So how do we identify that gray zone before it becomes a, a darker cloud, right? Of rain or storm or something. Um, so, I, I, you know, I'm really interested in this, I mean, as you said, some of the less radical notions. Um, so, for instance, um, I mean, I'd say right now the the question of the you know the the Johnny Depp Amber Heard trial is precisely this moment where you know um, a, a woman's sort of uh, ability 
to be in public or in a, in a court of law, but also in a, um, in a, in a court of public opinion to speak, um, to speak with, uh, uh, with credibility. Um, uh, also shout out a, a book coming out by Kat Higgins uh, and Sarbanes Weiser called Believability, which is precisely tracing these moments uh, in culture where women are uh, uh, disbelieved, all the ways that doubt and skepticism is mobilized before we wouldn't call that necessarily fascist. Um, but in, in, for me, that's it's like finding those ways that those um, uh, are connected, not to formalized fascism, have their way of getting there, but also invoke longstanding, um, even archaic notions of, uh, uh, of, of women's uh, identity. Which is to be, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, filled with a serpent and deceptive, and you know, the kind of religious dimension to that. So, so I think the gray zone is important because the gray zone also allows us to see the, how how uh, the long durée of this culture uh, uh, exists, right? So, to me, that's really important for the gray zone. The second one about uh, either education or intergenerational uh, dynamics. Um, and what does it mean to think about and elaborate non-fascist models uh, of living? I mean, um, specifically around alternative models of gender uh, production, uh, lots to say there. I will just say a, a couple things. Um, um, I, I like just like telling people to go read other people because they, they're, they're better at this than I am. Um, uh, Natasha Leonard's book, um, uh, 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 Becoming uh, Numerous, to be being numerous, becoming numerous. Now I forgot. But, um, but essays on a non-fascist life um, um, uh, is is excellent in this way to think about that. Um, um, but you know, uh, I would say also that uh, Petronella Lee has a nice section on the history of feminism and women um, in anti-fascist movements, historical, in the specifically in the interwar European period. So to to understand the role that's often marginalized when it comes to uh, understanding what anti-fascism is, because it's usually the, as, as, as you have written about when it comes to social movements too, right? It's usually the streets, right? The confrontational moment, but not all of the the collective uh, uh, planning, the logistics, the care work, the the all of the social reproduction components of a movement that usually are uh, seen as sort of feminized labor and therefore often erased um, uh, in the production of the uh, of the movement itself, right? So that so the idea of the of, of the of the of the knowledge and the information and the any organizing efforts behind the scenes. So I think that's also important to trace out historically when it comes to uh, 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 anti-fascism models. But to get to your, I think sort of almost like more ontological question, like what would it mean to have a different organization of uh, of gender? <laughs> passing from the critics to a model, because we think it is wrong, to a proposal. What is right, a right model? Because when we have to do with children, we have ourselves to be clear on that. And I found that we are not clear still. Yes. Um, well, I think this is, uh, um, there's a lot to be said there. So, so I, I would say, you know, it's, specifically in the U.S. and maybe elsewhere, right, the idea of what are children being told in schools specifically is precisely um, a key battleground and a key terrain, right, because the forces of the right um, are basically saying that to, um, to uh, open up a space for non-traditional, non uh, uh, patriarchal notions of uh, gender fixity and gender identity is itself a kind of perversion, is itself a kind of um, grooming, is a um, is in some ways for them pedophilia, right? So, so it's a, it's a it's, it's certainly a battleground. Um, uh, so I would say it's key. Now, I don't have a proposal. I would say the people working on things like what it means to be um, uh, Marquise Bay. For instance, new book, their new book, um, Black Trans Feminism, is precisely talking about blackness and transness and feminism as a kind of uh, um, uh, radicality that eliminates the roots, that opens up uh, creative possibilities through um, through non-fixity. In fact, unfixity. It's a, it's a kind of um, uh, return, and this is, I was going to talk about this with feminist anti-fascism. I mean, I'd say there's a way that, um, and many people won't like this, right, is that 
I think we have forgotten about the importance of the, the chaos of um, denaturalization because so much of the, of the fascists are riding a wave in which they want to renaturalize um, gender identity along with many other things, but um, uh, race as well, but um, a kind of renaturalization process. So the work that can be done to denaturalize um, is, is, is around gender order um, is, is important. Now, is it bewildering? Yes. Um, and this is precisely what why um, folks are talking about um, bewilderment, right, as an important thing that we should pay attention to and take care of, because mutations are are, are wild in that sense, are, are in the sense of like they undermine our abilities to do the things that we typically do, uh, right? Um, so, um, uh, uh, so, so anyway, so so I think that if we take metamorphosis seriously and mutation seriously then we, we have to start centering those conversations for people who are actually working through ideas of metamorphosis, unfixity, mutation, transformation. Um, so um, it's, it's, not a, it's not a proposal for a model. In fact, the models themselves might be the thing we need to constantly un, unfix in order to preserve and cultivate and nourish the gender experiments um, and other experiments that, um, that uh, will create a non-fascist life and already are by doing so. Um, the last, uh, well, I don't, know if, I don't know if this was part of that question or a dip with the, the fascist masculinity, sovereignty and autonomy. Um, um, I can, I'll leave that one for later. Um, just to check on time. Um, okay, the, the patriarchy, the difficult term of patriarchy, yes. Um, um, yes, okay, so let's see if I can remember this, um, what I was thinking. The reason, one of the reasons I think it's important to bring the term back, while we also, of course, figure out what the, the machines are, the capitalist machine that is also patriarchal, the, the settler colonialist machine that is also patriarchal and capitalist. I think what we have in our, in our analytic toolbox, unfortunately, um, is a kind of predisposition for the modern. And that is when I mean that by that, it's like people will invoke things like the last 500 years or the rise of, uh, of modernity or the enlightenment or settler colonial, which means settler colonialism, colonial uh, capitalism, uh, white supremacy in the in sense of the plantation system and enslavement. Unfortunately, I think what happens there is that we have a series of artifacts and documents that we can turn to, read, understand, interpret to make sense of the, the West, right, in that sense. We don't have the same kinds of uh, documents and artifacts when it comes to the long durée of ordering societies through gender hierarchies. Um, so, so the origin story that gets told and retold, we can always tell origin stories about the first encounter. Um, we can tell origin stories about uh, primitive accumulation um, uh, and all those systems have their stories that are told. And that's obviously really important. What is the origin story um, for patriarchy? This was a debate, obviously, that happened, um, uh, you know, in the, in the second half of the 20th century. But it seems to have been set aside for other, other terms like male supremacism, which, again, identifies some things, but doesn't get to this question. It's more about sort of like, I don't know, disposition or beliefs, attitudes um, um, that can be transformed through some intervention, which is like usually sometimes carceral, sometimes therapeutic. Um, uh, but, but for me, like it's important to, to re-ask those questions uh, because the thing that is seemingly, was, was seemingly so stable, right? A kind of the ideology uh, of, uh, of patriarchy, the kind of gender norms have been so troubled that um, the, 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 the autogenetic sovereigns who are in crisis have to um, uh, reinvoke that old, old history, right? Okay, so they're doing it. Um, what would it be for, mean for us to also say, well, maybe the reason they're doing it is because the origins of it are in something we need to uh, uh, analyze again, which for me is 
uh, something broadly called war, a war on women, uh, along with Silvia Federici, which does not begin with the witch hunts, even though those are documented, so we have a better sense. But the long durée of the war uh, uh, on women um, through the emergence of cultures around hunting, raiding, it's a whole different, it's a whole thing to open up. But, um, but this is why, to me, patriarchy still matters, um, uh, it, specifically around the a, a kinship project, right, that uh, among men and the exchange of women that is, is, is getting reinvoked now is what, I, is what I would say. And for that, I'll just say my last thing here about that, because you mentioned non-leaders. Like, how do we think about the non-leaders? And um, what I'm sort of looking at lately is the, the, the kind of uh, masculinization efforts that um, aren't the Christian fascist ones, um, but these kind of more occult or alchemical or pagan, um, but seen as kind of um, alternative culture, um, counterculture even. And so, so uh, people like Jack Donovan, uh, who, who's writing about, you know, trying to revive the Monarbund, but he's doing it with these kinds of, you know, self-help talks. Um, uh, and, um, or Jack Murphy, they're creating these societies. Um, uh, I think it's called the Liminal Order, um, which is a secret society of training men Right. Um, uh, it's an exclusive membership of training men um, in the uh, uh, in these arts. Right. Um, uh, and these traditional rites of initiation. So they're reviving these pre-Christian rites of initiation. So to me, like the followers, the non-leaders are actually um, forming now new kinds of monobuns, new war bands, new secret societies that I think need to be tracked. So but thank you. These are these are all very helpful um, thoughts. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Jack. Maybe there are some questions. Yeah, I think, um, let's see. Oh, um, okay. So, um, yeah, but then, so I was going to ask you, how about this before we get anything else? Um, um, you know, what I... Uh, I, what I really like about your piece that came out in 2015, right? The social reproduction, but not as we know it, which mm. I think you articulated some of your, um, some of these thoughts and really were helpful to me to think through what do we talk about when we talk about social reproduction that's not just biological reproduction, but you talk about the science of the concrete, right? Mm. Um, the metis, right? The kind of um, versions of craft and, um, uh, and, and, you know, knowledges, the accumulation and pooling of experience and knowledges um, to create different kinds of, um, as, as you, I think you draw from Mumford, life exalting technologies. I think this is a, uh, it's a brilliant piece and people should read it. And I, I was just wondering, you know, to me, that piece was also written almost at the, this stage, at least in the US, where it was like all these possibilities were happening. And then a year later, we have, you know, the installation of, of Trump and Trumpism and MAGAism, which becomes this massive kind of way of trying to, you know, uh, uh, shut that down, shut all that kind of social reproduction down, turn it once again into bio reproduction in the household. So I'm just wondering if you've had, um, since that was such a generative piece, if you've um, thought about um, what you've seen lately with uh, with anything around social reproduction and um, or maybe even talk about what you're writing. I, I don't know if it was mentioned, but you're, you have a, a new English version as well as new translations of Arcane of Reproduction. And so I think that's really exciting. And to hear how people are taking that work up again, um, uh, if you want to speak to that, I'd, I'd love to hear it. Yes, um, th there is um, a, a, a recent um, uh, interest towards this book because it uh, um, uh, it poses the question very important of the uh, recognition, the financial recognition of what women do uh, at home. But uh, I, I would like to pick up uh, the, the science of the concrete. Um, there is, a, I, I, I would say that there is the need absolutely uh, to um, reflect uh, and uh, to act for a power now, a power now of people, of women, of men, of children, of elderly, 
um, uh, so the, uh, while we construct a political power, we should be able also to construct a, a personal and mass power in our everyday life. So uh, all the um, left tradition now was uh, focused on uh, fighting in order to, uh, in the future, to have... Uh, to, to be able to gain power, power against the capital, power to destroy the, the capital system, etc. We see now the, 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 the society is very complex and uh, uh, um, uh, we need to, uh, while we are fighting, we, we need also to focus on all the way, all the strategy uh, that can be carried out in order to gain power now, gain power now on technologies, gain power now on uh, 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 agriculture, <laughs> on, on reproduction, on uh, uh, reproduction of new children, uh, it's, uh, in every aspect of our life. Because, for example, um, it is, uh, uh, as you said, the internet, uh, no? how it was, uh, uh, it is constructed. Uh, no? But of course, all the technology we have at home are uh, uh, with which we can hope to, uh, you know, decrease uh, the, the, the hour of housework and of reproduction. Uh, these technology are uh, uh, increasingly produced in a monopolistic uh, uh, regime and uh, we are end users without any power. You know, we depend on uh, uh, these uh, uh, companies for everything, for the maintenance, for the change, for... And the importance, uh, I, I stress in this uh, paper, the importance uh, to uh, create, uh, to reinforce, to connect us to the open source uh, software, to create alternative uh, strategy uh, to have power on this. Because I think without a power on technologies today, it is very difficult to create another society, a more an equal society. This is uh, the, the, you know, and the technology, uh, because also we must change the logic of technologies, come back to the life technology as Manford uh, said not the death technology we are again <laughs> in the perspective of what uh, uh, you so brilliantly uh, uh, wrote about this culture of death which is uh, also connected to technology to the technology we know now are all in this uh, um, perspective of uh, um, death culture internet, robotics, everything, uh, mobile phone, you know, and uh, uh, people must be aware of that. The, the logic, they, and especially, they are really punishing women. The, the, uh, the computer uh, culture uh, has been a culture very tough against women. In fact, uh, women, had a lot of difficulty in, as you know, in uh, um, uh, in uh, uh, overcome uh, these uh, this, uh, the disadvantage that the the, the computer uh, had for them for a series of reasons. But I see that there is uh, uh, some comments. Uh, well, I'm, well, I think uh, there might be some technical issues. Oh no, here we go. Um, uh, okay. Uh, well, uh, okay. I will, yes, I will just say, um, uh, the, the, the book is not out yet, Believability, um, but look for it soon <laughs> in the next, I don't know, uh, it's the, it's Sarah Benet Weiser and Kat Higgins, 
is the name of that um, upcoming uh, book. Uh, keep an eye out for it. Uh, but I want to uh, want to say something before we wind down. And and um, um, uh, but yeah, um, let's. Uh, um, I was going to say about technology again, but but sort of uh, yeah, this idea. You and I both have written about um, craft, actually, about knitting and the politics and ontology of of craft work, um, and how that long history is tied up with what we know as technology has also been kind of um, you know imminent to everyday life and the production of society and 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 um part of ordinary life and repair and um uh but also uh, become recently politicized so i think there's something really if we if we want to do a, a different kind of history of technology one of the places to go is um the history uh of various kinds of handicrafts or not just handicrafts but but uh spinning weaving um that was one of the earliest kinds of uh, 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 productions that was industrialized by capitalism too, right? And it was done often through the destruction of women's um, work <laughs> to, to be weaving and making um, in order to then take it, uh, you know, first through the guilds and then into the factories. Anyway, so I think that's just, it's, it's just one of those um, things that I like that, you know, even though we both come from different kind of approaches to different things, we found ourselves together in this idea of, of weaving so I'll just say something, and then if we want to um, uh, wrap up, unless there are comments. Um, um, uh, uh, um, okay, I think the thing is going to be one, but let me just let me just say I, what I've been thinking about lately. Um, instead of thinking about just production, I think one of the things that uh, if, if I, I'm trying to toy with the word of fabrication, right? Fabrication, which is something both very material in the sense of fabrics and um, and making the fabric fabrica mm -hmm. right? the kind of um, uh, uh, which is certainly the serbo creation word for factory maybe in other places right fabrication um, but also this idea of making things up there's the making things and making things up right just the the world of the imaginary um, the world of um, when we talk about spinning yarns or, or weaving our stories or um, those sorts of things. So I think there's something happening right now. I'm just throwing this out there because I've been speculating about it. That some of the kind of attacks on women um, about being liars is because they're associated with fabrication. The fabrication itself is seen as somehow fake. Right. Um, to fabricate something is to make, you know, to make up a lie, to make up a story. Um, I wonder if something about recently the kind of just overall hostility towards fakeness is itself part of at least adjacent to a war on women who are often the ones positioned as both fakers, but also makers in that sense of fabrication together. So um, um, but I don't know. I mean, I just it's just something to think about as you know, when you ask also about other ways of thinking about um, um, you know, anti-fascist living, you know, what if we were to take fabrication more seriously instead of um, this sort of idea of both production, reproduction, or that fabrication is, is primarily just about falsity, false and-, and but This hostility to, uh, against the fabrication is that the hostility uh, against uh, the human body, the body, the materiality of the body, you know, and the materiality of the body means uh, women means uh, the feminine but uh, i i was uh, add a little thing in the, in the end um uh, we should uh, take care also jack uh, of the uh, micro fascism that uh, these uh, company like facebook uh, uh, are uh, building uh, you know with algorithm microfascism, uh, racism, etc. Because they use a certain kind of algorithm are, uh, is uh, totally against, uh, in this uh, gray zone we talked about uh, before. It, but uh, we should uh, look about because and uh, check this very, uh, very closely because uh, 
it is very, very dangerous. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, okay. So, yes, we should. Um, I'm going to just read um, one question and then we'll, maybe we can wrap it up. Maybe this could be a way to kind of also think about last uh, thoughts. This is from uh, Neboisha. Hello, Neboisha. Uh, greetings to Belgrade. Um, uh, um, and uh, if we agree, I'm going to read it out loud. It's a quote from um, Marxist scientific research. Um, uh, let's see. Um, okay. I, I don't know if this is Adorno, but um, quote, authoritarian personality is the result of subordination in production processes, end quote. Um, subordination in production. Um, isn't then the gray zone, in fact, the consequence of the matrix of production reproduction relations inherent in capital's mode of production, which inevitably pro provides and normalizes preconditions for all social hierarchies, uh, including historical and actual patriarchy. Um, so is the gray zone the consequence of the matrix of production reproduction relations inherent in capitalist mode of production? I would say, actually, that may be the contemporary expression of it, but the, um, uh, and if, I mean, uh, unless we think the authoritarian personality is a modern personality, which I do not. Um, I think the impulse, the desire for authoritarian subjectivity pre-exists capitalism. So it is not the result of a subordination in production processes. Um, if anything, um, it was, I mean, one version of it when it comes to like pre-capitalist modes of production was that it was uh, precisely uh, the, uh, I mean, if you maybe call this subordination, it was the, the, the sort of like indifference, like men were not that productive. Um, to go out and hunt something, but it was like that wasn't the substance, the, sub, uh, the sustenance of the uh, of the society. Um, but they had some tools <laughs> that became weapons. Um, uh, so you know, so that became a new version of production process. Once you have like tools that become weapons, that's a very crude version of this. But it's just going to flip this idea that authoritarianism um, is some kind of modern uh, subject or even modern political formation. Um, so, so Neb, I think I'm going to, I'm going to say that, that it, that might be more the case, um, in the 20th century, but even that itself is a gray zone that has to be examined, whether it's more of a history of patriarchy that informs capitalism or vice versa. That itself is a historical question that cannot be simply answered by looking at the origins of capitalism. Um, so, um, this is sure, but uh, we need to articulate very well what was before, what existed before, you know, uh, yeah. uh, in uh, the different historical uh, uh, epochs uh, and uh, economical systems and political systems, etc. Yeah, um, uh, so I mean, I'll say something here to kind of like uh, noticing time and it's sort of related to the, the last question there about what the crisis is uh, that patriarchs are confronting. I mean, basically, the, the loss of patriarchal power um, is, is the mostly the, the crisis. Um, um, versions of uh, the control over um, women's, um, uh, the circulation and instrumentalization, objectification of women, I mean, is, is being challenged, at least. I'm not saying it's gone. Um, uh, it's But the, the little bit that has been challenged is enough to to provoke these kinds of um, uh, restorationist projects, um, um, so so I think that's that's a, a core component to this. And so for me, then what the um, uh, I would say that you know when we think about feminist anti-fascism in this case, then right, it's about recognizing that that crisis is unresolved. The fascists are trying to resolve it in a very particular way. Um, I do think we're in the moment. Um, that, you know, gets talked about a lot is quotation from Gramsci about the interregnum um, uh, sort of in between two orders or two formations. I won't even say orders. Um, uh, the old is dying. The, the new cannot yet be born. I mean, even if you don't want to do the organic, you know, by a reproductive model of that, just to think about what the, the transition component is, the, the transition time right now. He says all kinds of morbid phenomenon, monsters emerge in this interregnum, right? Um, so, so right now, those monsters um, and morbid monsters, necropolitical monsters, uh, are trying to restore an order um, that preserves their uh, um, 
their their you know the, the rule that they imagine they have, they did have, and they want to have. Um, and so for me, then another form of monstrosity um, is not always so pejorative. It's not the kind of the monster is always evil. The monster is the mutation that cannot yet be understood. It is it is a metamorphosis metamorphosis machine or a metamorphosizing uh, um, uh, a being that needs um, to be taken care of too. Right. It's not the thing that we just eliminate monsters. Um, we might be producing our own that we also want to um, uh, cultivate. So we want to abolish this is the abolitionist project. The, mo the monsters, I would say, are of, of patriarchal normalcy, <laughs> um, uh, which are like the attempt to reduce people to a thin dimension of existence. Um, now we have, with an abolitionist project against that. Um, uh, then we open up to other kinds of um, uh, monsters in common, if you will. Like, how does a common produce its own? Um, to produce a kind of um, one that involves, again, care also, like the care of, um, uh, of, of, of understanding the fragility of uh, metamorphosis, the fragility of mutation, and um, to, to preserve the conditions under which we can... Um, um, have a kind of commons through care with that. I hope that addresses that. Uh, okay, I thought that was the last uh, question, but okay. Um, how would you explain men antagonist? Um, um, how, would, how would you explain men antagonizing each other and or hierarchies between men? Um, I mean, I, 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 I'll just say this briefly, even though, so this is um, uh, back to analysis uh, after my rousing <laughs> call for the commons, um, but I would pay attention to how um, uh, masculinity orders uh, its own hierarchies. I mean, right now in the kind of digital cultural sphere, the kind of predominant uh, ideas are around alphas, betas, um, right? This, this, uh, the ways of thinking about that through, um, uh, they're not even necessarily thinking of it through attachments to the feminine. Um, they're thinking about it as um, uh, as sort of hierarchical through facial features, eugenics. That's the sort of black pill stuff. I don't want to get too deep into this because it's like a lot of details about that. But what I would say is that there is this kind of uh, internal hierarchy. However, part of that hierarchy um, for some is actually mentorship. So it's hierarchy turned into initiation to create pacts and brotherhoods um, that have a common enemy. And that becomes, um, generally speaking, the figure, um, the pacted figure, as Amoros would say, um, uh, of woman or the feminine. Um, so so um, there are certainly ways that um, this has uh, a both a heteronormative dimension about the degrees of which masculinity um, has to approach a certain model, a certain kind of conventional patriarchal uh, alpha model. Um, but there are also versions of this that engage in the homosocial dimension of it too. Um, there are, there are sort of, you know, so th there, uh, there's both history of the monarbund being um, uh, uh, not just gay friendly, but kind of organized around um, erotic relations uh, among men. So, so there's still, uh, it's a complicated question because there are hierarchies, but then there are also mitigations of those hierarchies because the primary thing that is being fled is woman. Um, the flight um, and the creation of new kinship structures still presumes um, a flight from, uh, from women. So, so it's, it's an empirical question. I think in different ways, there are different um, uh, places to find the hierarchies. And I think that's the challenge of this kind of, analysis is that is like it's happening we just have to pay more attention to all the ways the gray zone as leopoldina so well put it right as you put it which is um these things that don't seem to be um relevant to this question of fascism but it's it's the incubator um it's the it's the formation of the kind of social body that um that wants to implement these policies so thank you thank you for those questions Thank you for the question and thank you for your answers, Jack. Thank you, Leopoldina. That was fantastic. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I hope next time we can 
meet in person somewhere and, and have yeah. this conversation. Yeah, um, you wrote to me and uh, you... <clears throat> yeah, wonderful. Um, so I don't know if we end this, um, or Molly, have you come back to end this? Or um, um, So uh, meanwhile, I would just say, you know, there's lots of stuff out there to, um, to read. Um, uh, and um, to examine. And so I thank everyone for being here today, and, and especially Leopoldina. Thanks to Malo and Common Notions. Um, and uh, I look forward to reading uh, if there's more chat somewhere. Um, uh, look forward to reading that. But thanks, everyone, and uh, um, and, and and take care with um, the uh, the ways you're living your anti-fascist lives. Okay. Thank Bye. you. Bye.